you've got your Bibles open to the book of Acts, I hope you'll uh, keep them right there. We're going to be studying, of course, from the book of Acts. You know, if you've been here on recent Sunday nights, that we have been uh, involved in an ongoing series on the book of Acts, where we're trying to really cover from the beginning to the end in several months. Our young people are studying this with the Last of Leaders program. This is the Last of Leaders Bible Bible material, and we did this last year with Proverbs, and trying it again this year with Acts. But we are kind of at a, a reset point in a natural kind of way, uh, it being the first of the year, and we've been studying the book of Acts now for several months, at least a couple months, and I thought this would be a good time for us to maybe do a reset, to do a review. And so, uh, knowing that we like countdown lists, knowing uh, how you know, that kind of appeals to us, I thought we would do a, a lesson tonight, or this afternoon, that, that I'm just calling the top seven things to remember from Acts 1 through 7. We've gone seven chapters now into this study, and I think this is a good place for us maybe to uh, do some review. I don't know about you, but I like countdown lists. Uh, they're interesting to me. I, I'm a beaver. We, we've been doing this in uh, Wednesday night Bible classes, and I'm a beaver. If you haven't been in our class, you don't know what that means, but it means I like information. Uh, I like things organized. and you know, So a list of something really appeals to me. Maybe it doesn't appeal to you as much, but I think it appeals to a lot of people because we, you know, music, there's the top, you know, 20 or the top 50 or 100, whatever, they count down every week, you know, the billboard list on music. Uh, they're, uh, you know, sports fans, we tune in every Sunday afternoon to find out who's the, you know, the top teams in the AP and the coaches poll. You know, we like those lists and they're, you know, from, you know, 25 down to one. David Letterman has, you know, done wonders with his top 10 list. Uh, best part of his show, in my opinion, if you ever watch it. Uh, and so we like these countdown lists, so I thought tonight we would just uh, take just a moment or two to, to look back in uh, these first seven chapters of the book of Acts and just uh, see some of the major lessons. Maybe bring out some lessons that we didn't see the first time around that um, are good and helpful to us and things that we ought to remember if you're just looking at these seven chapters in a cursory way. And so... Uh, in honor of a countdown list, we're going to start with number seven. We're going to go backwards from seven to one. Obviously, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on any of these. Uh, but let's start with number seven. The first major lesson, number seven, that, that we can remember from the book of Acts, chapters one through seven, is that nothing big happens unless God is behind it. You know where I'm going with this probably if you're there. In chapter one, you remember, you recall that... Um, the big thing that happened in the book of Acts is the church began. But there had to be some things that preceded that before it could occur. And, and so if you'll look in Acts chapter 1 and start reading with me verse 4. We're going to read several verses tonight, so keep your Bibles out and open to the book of Acts. Uh, we'll read these first um, four verses, uh, starting in verse 4, 4 through 8. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time receive the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. What the big thing is here at the beginning of the book of Acts, that reminds us of this principle, nothing big happens unless God is behind it, is God is getting ready to start the next, and really the great last institution to be established on earth. Um, from the very beginning of time, He had established, as you recall, the family there in the Garden of Eden. We know that in time he established government. He ordained government. You can read about that in Romans, the 13th chapter. But the three great organizations or institutions that God has established, that he ordains and he upholds and he approves the family, government, and the church. And, and all of these are big things because God is behind them. And here we see that God is getting behind uh, the establishment of the Lord's church. Uh, just to. Uh, to continue to see that, if you go over to chapter 2, we'll see that this is the day of Pentecost, the day the church began. And here you see God being behind these events. Beginning in verse 1, 
when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, a, a rushing mighty wind. It filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared uh, to them divided tongues as of fire. And, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Once again, the confirmation, the fulfillment of that promise from chapter 1 and verse 8 about the Holy Spirit being overshadowed with power from on high. And here's the confirmation of that, the, com the fulfillment of that promise. And it's just a reminder that God is behind what is happening. There is no reasonable, logical, human, physical way to explain what happens in Acts chapter 1. These unlearned and uneducated men, in the sense that they'd never studied these foreign languages, to all of a sudden be able to speak these languages. But yet they were able to do so. It's because God was behind this event. You know that the Scripture says in Psalm 27 and verse 1, The Lord builds the house. They who labor, or do so, labor in vain. And so, all big things need God behind them. And if something seems to be going well, if something seems to be a big thing, if something seems to be a popular thing, you need to examine if God is behind it. If God's not behind it, it's really not the big thing. It's really not, of course, the approved thing. Top lesson, seven to learn. Nothing big happens unless God's behind it. The second lesson that I want to encourage you to understand, number six, uh, starting over can only occur through God. Starting only, only over can only occur through God. Can you go to the next slide up there, Gary? I'm having trouble advancing those. You'll go, uh, go to chapter 2 and skip down uh, a few verses uh, uh, in chapter 2. And uh, let's pick up reading some beginning uh, oh, around, verse, around verse 36. Go back one slide. Starting over can only occur through God. Let's re begin reading in verse 36. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Christ. Now just to reset, remember this is the, uh, kind of the end of the lesson that Peter had preached on the day of Pentecost. He along with the other eleven stood up, they preached the gospel, and here we have the, the recorded sermon of Peter. Uh, and so he's beginning to sum up his lesson about Jesus Christ. And he reminds them that they, the Jews who were bringing him, had been responsible for his death. Uh, that they had crucified him. And it says in verse 37, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you, and your children, to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he testified and exhort, uh, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. And those who gladly received the word were baptized. And on that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. I want to remind you, and it's a perfect lesson to learn for this time of the year. I suggested this at the end of the lesson this morning. If you want to start all over, if you really want to start all over, you do that only through God. You don't do it because there's a new day and a new year. There's no magical, spiritual, cleansing quality to the first day of the year. It's just another day. It's the day that people take advantage of to kind of restart, to resolve, to do some things differently. But if there are sins in your life, the new year doesn't change that. The only thing that changes that is the blood of Jesus Christ. These people wanted to start all over. And they realized that they had to start with God. They asked God's apostles on this occasion, what do we need to do? And the answer had to do with obeying the gospel plan of salvation. So if you want to start all over, you can only do that through God. That's a big lesson to learn from Acts chapter 1-7. through Next lesson to learn. Um, nothing big can be sustained unless God directs it. This is number five if you're counting down. Nothing big can be sustained unless God directs it. Now we've already seen that the church was established here in Acts the second chapter, but now the establishment of the church brings about an opportunity for God to give uh, the instructions for how the church is supposed to 
to live, for, for how the church is supposed to worship, for how the church is supposed to function. You, you, and that's really the rest of the New Testament, incidentally. incidentally. But you, uh, you get the, 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 the beginning of that here in Acts chapter 2, and uh, we'll start reading at, at verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things common. They sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God, having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. A lot of men, a lot of movements seem to be going well. Makes the news, especially nowadays, anything can make the news. You can get your 15 minutes of fame or infamy um, with the way that things can be reported and shared today. But rest assured, if something seems big, it can only sustain itself for just a little while if it's not of God. You know, from time to time in the New Testament, and you remember Gamaliel's advice in the book of Acts about this new movement of the church. Remember, he gave some advice to his fellow Jews on one occasion, and he said, look, we've seen this happen before. I'm just paraphrasing, of course. We've seen this happen before. And he gave a couple of examples of some big things that happened, and they seemed to be going well. And then all of a sudden, they fell to pieces. And, and he recommended to his fellow Jews, Let, let's just kind of treat this new movement called Christianity the same way. And if it's of God, you know what? can't stop it. You just cannot stop it. If it's not of God, it'll fall flat on its face. And that is a powerful lesson for us to remember. Nothing big can be sustained unless God directs it. You know why the church is here 2,000 years later? It's because God directs the church. We read the, the beginning of his direction here in Acts chapter 2, uh, beginning in verse 42, of how they, they did what God wanted them to do. They continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine. They were together as, and worked together as one with another people. They worshiped together as the church. They let God give them their marching orders. And now 2,000 years later, this great big movement is still going forward because God behind it. Next lesson, as we count these down, uh, this, would be number, this would be number four. And that is, God's plan involves me speaking up for Him. One of the great lessons I learned from the book of Acts, especially early on, is God's plan involves me speaking up for Him. You say, well, of course it does. You're the preacher. It involves you speaking up for God as well. You've got a couple of stories here in Acts 3 and 4 that that remind us of that. Now, you remember at the beginning of chapter 3, Peter and John, they go into the temple, and there they meet this lame man who's been uh, laid there because uh, he can't take care of himself, and he's asking alms, and Peter and John, they don't have any money. They can't give him any money, but they can give him what they've got, and they can give him the gift of God, and that's what they do. And they heal this man. That stirs up a lot of uh, commotion, and uh, once again, um, people living for God it gets people's attention. And so if you look at Acts chapter 3 and verse 12, it says that when the people saw it, <clears throat> when they saw that this man had been healed, when the people saw it, um, he responded, Peter, when, when Peter saw it, uh, that these people were coming together and, and wanting to, to know more about this, verse 11, when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us, as though by our power of godliness, we made this man walk. It's when Peter starts to speak up to those who are interested in and say, look, let, let me tell you why this man is healed. He, he had to speak up and explain why these great events were happening. People all around you, when they see good things happening in the church or in your life, uh, sometimes they don't understand why these things are happening. And it takes someone speaking up for God to br uh, bring their attention to that. Over to chapter 4 and verse 1. The story continues. Now as they spoke to the people, see they're still speaking up, as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them. Uh, again, they have to answer for what is being done as they're, they're preaching and teaching in the name of Jesus. 
As a matter of fact, you're very familiar with what is about to happen next. Look down to verse 13 and let's begin reading right there. When these people saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived uh, that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. That says something about how you can be changed when you stay with Jesus, when you, you're around Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. And when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For indeed, that a notable miracle has been done to them uh, through them is evident to all who live and dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that it spreads no further among the people, watch this now, they said, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in His name. So they called them, commanded them not to speak at all or teach in the name of Jesus. And Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you just... For we cannot speak the things which we have seen and heard. And so uh, there is that, that message, that lesson here in the Word of God that it's up to us to speak up for God. God has no mouth today except His people. If the world is going to learn about Jesus, if the world is going to get the details about the story of Jesus, it, it depends upon us to be willing to speak up and to share that with the people. And that's a great lesson to, for us to learn. Uh, lesson uh, number three, as we're counting down from seven to one, this is a real powerful lesson, I think, from chapter five, and that is, sin is real, personal, and deadly. You know, you're reading about all these great things taking place in the Lord's body, reading about the, the tremendous growth, how, how the church is making a difference, and all of a sudden you get slapped in the face with the reality of sin here in chapter 5. The story goes like this. A certain man named Ananias and Sapphira with him, his wife, sold a possession. He kept back part of the proceeds. His wife also, being aware of it, brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit to keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not your own, in, in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So a great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the young men rose and wrapped him up, carried him out, and buried him. Now it was about three hours later that his wife came in, not knowing what had happened, and Peter answered, her, tell me whether you sold the lamb for so much. She said, yes, for so much. Then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell dead at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in, found her dead, and carried her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all those who heard these things. I mentioned this when we covered this a few weeks ago. The first youth activity in the Lord's church, you remember this? They got together and buried somebody. Not exactly the most popular youth activity that can be planned in the church, but that's the first thing. We've got a record of the church, church's youth doing. Some young men buried Ananias and Sapphira. Why is that? It's not because, it's not because that they didn't have some good intentions, I'm sure. Matter of fact, nobody made them sell this piece of land. Nobody, nobody forced them to sell this piece of land. It was theirs. It was in their control when they owned it. Here's the problem. They saw the good that might could be accomplished. Perhaps they saw the praise that might be heaped upon someone, like a man by the name of Barnabas at the end of chapter 4 that had sold some land and came and laid it at the apostles' feet. Whatever their motive was, they certainly surely intended it to be good, but they just uh, deceived in stating how much they sold it for and how much, of course, they were going to give. They acted as if they were going to give it all. And there was deception. You remember the great lesson we learned here? It's, it's, it's a lesson, it's a sin that people struggle with today. The sin of lying. I mean, they lied to God on this occasion. It doesn't matter if you lie to 
your parents, doesn't matter if you lie to someone else, a friend, spouse. Sometimes we lie to God. And that's essentially what they were doing on this occasion. And it's a lesson that sin is real, personal, and deadly. The wages of sin is death. Counting down top seven lessons from Acts 1-7, through seven, the second in our countdown is this. If you're willing to complain, you ought to be willing to help. You know where this story comes from. It comes from Acts chapter 6. Let's just see what happens. Let's remind ourselves what happens. Now in those days when the multitude of the disciples was, uh, when the number of the disciples was multiplying, then there arose uh, a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists. The Hebrews, of course, would have been the, the, the Jews that spoke the Hebrew language, the native language. The Hellenists would have been the Jews who were, had a Greek background who, who spoke perhaps Aramaic or Greek. And so there was a dispute against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve, the twelve apostles, summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, it's not desirable that we should leave the Word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. And we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. So the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, a Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles when they had prayed. They laid hands on them. Then the Word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. Great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. I don't think I pointed this out. Uh, I was reminded of this after we covered this lesson a few weeks ago. The ones that were complaining were the Greek-speaking people. Greek background. The Hellenists. They were complaining against the Hebrews. They were saying, our, our widows are being neglected in, in a distribution of food that apparently was taking place on a regular basis. And when they got the, the church together there in Jerusalem, when the apostles called for a meeting to dis- determine what should be done, you want to know who got appointed to see to this need? The Greek-speaking people. As a matter of fact, I mean, this is as far as we can really go with this. All seven of these, these men that were chosen, these are Greek names. Uh, and, and so there's wide disagreement as to exactly what that means. Were all of these Greek-speaking uh, did they have Greek names or some of them Greek speaking? Some believe that, that perhaps three of them were Hebrew, three of them were Greek speaking, and um, one was a proselyte maybe from another region. And, and he, he's mentioned here. Perhaps all of these could have been uh, Greek. We don't really know, but here's the point. If you're willing to murmur about something, and I want to make sure that we understand, Philippians 2.14 says, let all things be done without complaining and murmuring. But sometimes there are legitimate concerns that we have within the body. And if you see one of those concerns and you're willing to bring it up, here's a practical point to remember. Also be willing to, to get involved and in, in find the solution for that. Uh, it's only fair uh, if you think something needs to be done for you to volunteer to be able to do it. Uh, one of our young men won an iPad Mini this past weekend at Exposure because uh, there was a, a question that was asked, um, what does it mean to be a servant? Is that right, Daniel? Something like that. And, and, and the answer that was given, and I'm just paraphrasing, and, and it goes something like recognizing something needs to be no, done and being willing to do it without griping or complaining. And uh, that's a correct answer. That's a servant's answer. And on this occasion, there was a need for something to be done. And... Some of the ones that perhaps said, we need to do something about this, they were the same ones who were willing to say, okay, I'll do something about it. And that's a great lesson for us to learn from the book of Acts. First, most important lesson, I would say, um, for us to remember, and that is this. Christianity is a religion worth dying for. Christianity is really worth dying for. We studied very recently, just a couple of weeks ago, from Acts the seventh chapter, Stephen preaches a great, powerful, historic lesson. 
And at the end of that lesson, those who heard him did not agree with him. Um, and they gathered around him. They stoned him. We are introduced to what at the time was one of the great persecutors of the Lord's church, Saul of Tarsus. And then, of course, we're going to be studying as we go into the rest of the book of Acts about him becoming a great apostle and preacher for the Lord. This moment, this moment in time, we believe, changed his mind about Christianity. A man who had convictions and was willing to speak out about them, even if it cost him his life, we believe motivated one of the great apostles in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul. And why is that? Because Stephen was willing to die for his religion. He's willing to speak up for what he believed in, even if people would disagree with him. And we saw the manner in which he died a couple of weeks ago. We saw how that he was able to, to see Jesus standing there at the right throne of God. And what a, what a blessing that must have been with him as he left this world and entered into the next to know that he, he was going home to see Jesus. There's not really a better way to look at death for a Christian than that. You're, you're leaving a place that's not really made for you to go to a place that is made for you. That's, that's what makes Christianity worth living, no matter what. But if it ever comes to the point that you have to die for the Lord, the example of Stephen is just a reminder. It's worth it. And your death may spawn another great soldier for the Lord. And that's exactly what happened on this occasion. As we've counted these lessons down, seven through one, Christianity is worth dying for. I want to ask you this question as we end this lesson, as we're about to sing this invitation song. Are you ready to meet the Lord? Just a simple question. Don't mean to scare you. Hope you've got many, many more days left to live in this world. But we're not promised tomorrow. We know that death, according to James, is like a vapor. It's here for just a little while and it vanishes away. Or we know our life is like a vapor. It's here just a little while and it vanishes away. Death can occur at any time. It's important for a man wants to die and after this the judgment. Christianity is worth dying for. But the only way you can go and be with the Lord, be at that place, that prepared place uh, with the Lord, is to have prepared to be there. And, and that's the question we ask you. Are you prepared to meet your God? If you're not ready to meet Him, if you haven't become a Christian, or if you wandered away and need to come back home, why don't you come right now as we stand and as we sing?